Good morning, friends. Happy New Year. Actually, it's not morning at all. It's afternoon, both on the East Coast at Eastern Time and Central, if you're tuning in because you're a fan of Sarah Beth Nelson, as am I. Ooh, I don't know if you can hear that through the sound suppressing Zoom technology, but my water kettle is boiling. Today, I think I'm going to brew up a nice pot of friendship tea. It's a lovely herbal blend that I got from my storytelling buddies in Macon, whom I miss terribly, but it just makes sense that today, since we're going to be talking all about the art and craft of storytelling, that I would be having a blend that is from my storytelling buddies and that I would be uh, having something that is all about friendship because Sarah Beth Nelson is someone who I have known for, I don't even know, I'll have to ask her to remind me, refresh my memory. Um, Sarah is a storyteller par excellence who sadly left us here in the Atlanta neighborhood and has moved to the northern climes. So Let's see, Sarah, are you able to come and join us in this tea house? There she is. Hello, it feels like a, um, like summoning a ghost. Like, are, yes. are you with us? Yeah, twice. <laughs> Sarah, are you there? <laughs> Hello, here I am. <laughs> and are you having tea today as well? I I am. I have um, a Tulsi tea that my sister sent me for Christmas. I know some people are like super into the Tulsi. Um, that's like their jam all the time. Yeah. So it was the, the flavor. What's that? It was the flavor like the, the, uh, Tulsi. Oh, the flavor. Um, it's related to basil. I don't think it tastes the same as basil, but I can see how they're related. Uh-huh. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In that same way that like licorice and um what's that? Um there's a spice that you put in food that tastes very like licorice. Um but that's probably like what licorice is made of, right? Um and I'm just like, mm. oh is it is it fennel? Or yes, yes that's okay. it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, welcome to my tea party. I'm glad you're here. How long have we been friends? We've known each other since what? Was it 2011? <laughs> 20? I mean, Carapay started in 2010. Did you come the very first year? Oh, um, no. I think I started coming a year or so after. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Long time. Oh. That's like 12 years. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so, you are a storyteller, a librarian, library scientist, um, mom, long distance runner, um, a listener of audiobooks, mm -hmm. um, a, now a Michigan Wisconsinite. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, how many identities is that? That's a lot of identities. What are what are your other yeah. identities? <laughs> That's a lot. Um, uh, I was I was thinking about recently. I've become a Dungeons and Dragons player. Really? Um, I don't know if I'm like so in it that I would like really heavily identify that way. But um, uh -huh. yeah, I actually I started out um, like a couple years ago now doing research with one of my students when I was at UW Whitewater. Um, she was really interested in studying Dungeons and Dragons games at libraries. Mm -hmm. And so I was um, observing some games and interviewing players. Uh, but then um, my husband was already involved with a game online with some of our college friends. And um, so he after I no longer had Wednesday night classes, he said, Hey, why don't you join, join this game with us? <laughs> so I've been playing with them for, um, for several months now and 
finally, I'm starting to feel like not such a newbie. Like mm -hmm. I maybe kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've heard yeah. a lot of people who are into storytelling are also into D&D. &D. Like there's like a nice natural connection there. Like, cause you kind of, it is a group storytelling activity, right? You're making mm -hmm. it up and you go along. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is some natural overlap, uh, which was part of how I got involved with the research because um, I wanted to look at stories that are told in and about libraries. So that's library D and D is definitely storytelling in the library. And then um, as a player, I'm learning that I appreciate when the DM uh, has opportunities for us to like ha bring in our backstory and have character development and not, not just fight all the time. Mm -hmm. So for those of you all who aren't up on the lingo, <laughs> that means dungeon master. So that's sort of like the lead storyteller who's like telling everybody else uh, how, how to run the game. Um, so very cool. Yeah. Um, so before we launch too much into storytelling, here we are, it's the top of the year. This is my first TN jam of the year. Um, I guess all of the podcasts, all of the, the things, all of the blogs, everybody's talking about new year's resolutions. So do you make new year's resolutions? What's, what's your take on the, your hot take on, on new year's intentions and so forth? Well, so I'm not, I'm not real big on making <laughs> New Year's resolutions, um, but I had read in a mindfulness blog uh, several years ago, the idea of um, building habits instead of like setting goals. And mm -hmm. I do, I do like that idea um, because sometimes goals, uh, you know, if you don't set out the path of how you're going to get to that goal, it's just something that's always there <laughs> that you're, you're not actually working toward. Um but habit habit building can feel more attainable and and kind of has this built in idea of like it's a thing that you have to work on every day. Um, so I kind of think about that um, as far as like stuff that I want to work on. And I think um, my kind of continuing journey is on um, mental health, uh, you know, dealing with anxiety, anxious tendencies. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, trying to, to include more mindfulness in my life. And um, uh, I think recently, just something that I'm working on is, uh, you know, being more intentional about doing things with, with friends, with people, um, you know, online, face-to-face. -face. Uh, we really moved away from that during COVID. Um, and also as, as somebody who's kind of an introvert and can have some anxiety around like meeting new people or, uh, you know, even asking people to do things like, Oh, what if they don't like me? Or what if they say no? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I find myself needing to be deliberate about getting, getting back out there and doing things with people. And then when I do, it's wonderful and we have a good time. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I spend my whole life on doing some of those middle school narratives about that. They won't like me shit. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. like. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So where, where and when did the running stuff come in? Cause I feel like that was not a part of your life when we first met, that was sort of more like a five, six years ago habit that, uh, was that a new year's resolution? Like how did that start? <laughs> um, well, it, my sister kind of got me into the long distance running. Um, so I, I started running as an adult. I was not a runner as a kid. I, whenever we had to run the mile in school, I was convinced I was going to die. Um, <laughs> and, um, so I, I started doing some running, um, as an adult, I was finishing up my, my master's degree in library science and I was working at a public library and it was the first time that I didn't have access to a gym like for free. Cause I had moved away from the university and, uh, I thought I would give running a try as something that was ki kind of inexpensive to do. Um, mm. And I worked up from like, I couldn't even run an entire mile. I would run like a lap and then alternate running and walking. And um, I slowly built up to where I could run a mile. And then I tried to run for 30 minutes solid. And then uh, I kind of hovered around three miles for a while. That was like a very comfortable, you know, 
maybe two, three times a week, I go out and run three miles and that's great. And then, um, when I, uh, I was still living in Atlanta, um, near the end of my time in Atlanta, my sister had suggested that we sign up for a half marathon together. And, uh, so that was when I bumped up my training. Um, and that first half marathon that we ran, um, in, in Athens, Georgia, the half, half, uh, I had increased my distance from three miles to, I think nine miles was the longest run I did before the half marathon. And so when we were in the race, I was pretty good until 10 miles. And then the last three miles, I felt like I was running through waist deep mud. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's pretty, pretty bad. Um, So we ran a couple half marathons. And then um, when I was doing my doctoral program in North Carolina, uh, she came to visit me and we ran a half marathon there in Raleigh. And then um, that race offered a half and a full. And I said, next year, let's do the full marathon. And so I trained over the course of the year for a full marathon. And uh, my sister said, I'll come watch you. <laughs> so, so she did. She did come back um, to watch me uh, run it. But that's that's when I got into doing some of the longer distances. Wow. Do you feel like... Um... And so I know that you've gotten really into listening to to books while you are um, while you're running. Are there other con- connections between storytelling and running for you? I mean, I feel like for me, in the times that I've tried to run, um, it is about sort of changing the narrative for me, like telling myself a story of like empowerment. Like I have to tell myself I can do this, you know. Or um, I think there's just like some. I'm curious, like for story, for a storyteller, what does it mean to become a runner? Like wh- where are the connections for you in that? I'm going to pour my tea while you're talking. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I think, I mean, it's something that you can apply yourself to and you can see yourself improving. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that might be, that might be more true with running than storytelling. Sometimes the improvements might be hard to see, but I think mm. anything like that is satisfying where you can work at it and say, yeah, I got, I got better. I have these, these nice. uh, measurable results. Yeah. Um, I think also that running, being outdoors, doing something challenging lends itself to like becoming a story, you know, mm. like you're, yes. you know, when you go, when you go out and you challenge yourself, then you're living a story. Um and so it might, it might be a good story to tell later. Um, I, uh, I've read some of those, those books, uh, listened to some of the books like, um, Born to Run, mm-hmm. uh, and the author tells the story of some races in there. Um, and I feel like for a lot of runners, as soon as you finish, um, especially a, a difficult race, like you want to tell the story of that race. Like, okay, here's what I was thinking at this mile marker. And then, <laughs> at this mile marker. And, um, yeah, and I definitely do have some stories that I tell now that are, that are from, you know, running or hiking or, or being outdoors. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I remember I, I had a friend over for dinner and I was, I was telling her about this, like, this thing that had happened like a day or two before. And like, I had her and this other person, like all wrapped up in this, like, bizarre situation and all of a sudden like I was just only halfway through this situation and all of a sudden my friend just like stopped the story in the middle and she's like I don't know if bizarre crap happens to you because you're a storyteller or if you're a story te- storyteller because all this shit happens to you and she, <laughs> I like I thought about that for days like do you think that like we are on a quest to have all of these adventures because we're looking for the next big story or if we just observe life and that's where our stories come from. Like, do you think that boring people just don't have any good stories to tell? Like what, is it a recursive loop? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think it's, I think there's probably some truth to both things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I do think that as a storyteller and especially as a storyteller who tells personal stories that we develop an ability to examine our lives and see the stories that are Mm -hmm. there. And also story 
storytelling helps us make sense of life's events. Um, and mm -hmm. so it, it feels good. It's a good way to look back at our lives um, and, and just help us make sense of things. Um, I don't know, as storytellers, maybe we, you know, also like seek out um, some events, so, you know, uh, activities yeah. that might be story worthy. I, I try not to do that, like, really intentionally. Um, like, oh, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm gonna go do this just so I can tell a story about right, it right. later. Yeah. Um, I'll admit that I, I do think about like, if I want to keep having new personal stories to tell, I do need to have somewhat of an interesting life, you yeah. know? <laughs> Um, cause I've looked back at like, I, I have a lot of, uh, I have stories from childhood. I have stories from when my kids were little. Um, and I've had moments when I've thought, is that it? Am I just mining the same areas over and over again? Or are there going to be new stories? And, um, there usually are, but yeah, I get it. going, going out and doing some interesting things I think helps. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to have any new stories if you just sit around on the couch and watch TV all day. <laughs> Yeah, so there was um, Douglas Adams who wrote the Hitchhiker's Guidebooks. Mm. Um, I think it was in um, in one of his personal essays. He talked about how uh, when he wrote his he wrote he wrote the first book. Um, he was drawing on all his life experience, and so it was very rich. And then by the second or third book, the main character is making jokes about staying in hotels because that's his life now that he's a famous author. He travels around and does book signings and stays in hotels. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's pretty depressing. I mean, I think like, like uh, <laughs> every, every moment could be revisited for new stories. Like you're not really just done with all of your life experience up until yeah. that point. But, um, but yeah, he had that, he had that real shift from like, you know, this part of his life to staying in hotels. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes from the storytelling world is either you can have a good experience or you can have a good story. It's from that book, um, Long Story Short. It's like mm -hmm. this woman who's won the moth a bunch of times and it's her like kind of knowledge for how she goes about constructing a story. And I always think about that quote when I'm like walking out the door to go on the 7,000th first date, you know, <laughs> like, all right, I've got plenty of good stories. Like I would really like to have a nice experience, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 So if you don't mind speaking of like how people go about constructing a story, um, do you, do you mind to share a little bit with folks about what your process is for constructing a story? Yeah. So I have, uh, I would use different approaches for like a folk tale or a classical story than for personal stories. Mm -hmm. um, for personal stories, I, you know, I go to shows like Carapace and The Moth. Um, we have some other local shows up here in Wisconsin, um, Ex Fabula in Milwaukee and Mad City, Story Slam in Madison. Um, and uh, all of these shows have themes. And so that that is part of my process is going to these shows and letting those themes help, help provide some inspiration. Um, Sometimes something will come to me right away, but other times I have to kind of um, marinate on it. And I've noticed that uh, I can't I can't force it. Like usually if I think about it too hard, I'm not coming up with anything good. And I have to kind of like think about it and let it go and come back to it. And usually a better idea will like pop up when I'm not <laughs> thinking about it too hard. Um, which is a little frustrating because sometimes we want to do the work and just get it, you know, get it done. But um, those are usually better ideas. Um, and then uh, I do a lot of practicing in the shower. <laughs> it's just, um, I, uh, that is maybe an another habit I should build this year is to carve out more time to work on storytelling instead of just doing it in between, <laughs> you know, other things that I do. Um, but yeah, shower is good downtime when my, my brain can work. Uh, and I just, I just kind of start like telling it. Um, I do often have to ask myself what I want the ending to be. Like, what is the point of this story? Where do I want it to go instead of just following it wherever it, it naturally leads? Um, 
And uh, then I usually have to cut it down because if I am going to one of those uh, slams or open mics, they tend to have a five minute time limit. Um, And I actually think that that is really useful for like a first draft of a personal story because it makes you think really hard about what's important. And then if I want to flesh it out later for a longer version, uh, I usually understand the story better Mm -hmm. because I did have to cut it down to the most important parts. Um, for, uh, so I, what I'm telling other sorts of stories that are not personal stories, um, they're usually from classical mythology. And, um, for those, uh, I I actually have this database that I really like that's put out by Tufts. It's called Perseus. And, um, they have a whole bunch of, um, materials in Greek and Latin, um, and in translation, and everything is just there. You can just read it on your computer. <laughs> um, and uh, and it's searchable. Um, so if I'm like working on a story about a particular character from mythology, I can search their database and pull up like everybody who mentioned them. Um, and so I, I do this research, I take a whole bunch of notes. Um, I will start creating an outline and then I, I make some choices about how I might want to change the story. Um, I'm often telling stories about women and I do make significant edits to empower the women because they were not necessarily very empowered in the original versions of the stories. Um, so I'll do a little bit of outlining and then decide if I want to change it and then and then pull together my final outline. But, but what else you do that I really love is that you do these really interesting blends where you pull together the mythology or the folk tale and you use those as as symbols or jumping off places for your own personal stories. And I, I just love that because I think a lot of times today people don't find that other stuff as approachable as they used to. And it to me, it like gives new segues into the, you know, the 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 larger stories, the ancient stories by by giving us like the the te- the teaser or the you know the trailer version of what that story is and then then we get the the version of that from your life perspective at it reminds me of we had this amazing uh, dancer storyteller um writer uh who's back in the Atlanta community now Celeste Miller um and she's uh kind of a scholar of that stuff too I, I really wish that you were here sometimes because I think y'all would really jam on knowing each other uh, and she's amazing at, at weaving in mythology and, and folk tales into her own personal stories. Um, I think it's just such a, a beautiful way to to keep like some of those those ancient, um, almost um, sacred stories like still super relevant to us in our very, um, you know, profane and everyday lives. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I think that people used to live a lot closer to their folklore and that it was very natural to see connections between folklore and your your life because it just felt more relevant and more immediate. And maybe that's something that like as storytellers, we do live with these stories and can make some of those connections. Um, And again, I think it can be part of sense making, like sometimes other stories also help us make sense of our lives. Mm hmm. I wonder, I mean, I didn't really like, we didn't talk about this too much in terms of setting this up, but would you be interested in, in telling folks a story today? Ooh. Um, I can, yes, I can do that. <laughs> I'm just trying to think about what would be a good. I, I love it. Um, I feel like, you know, any chance I have to hear a story, I'll take it <laughs> from you, especially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, so I think just, um, I'll just tell a a short little story uh, that I I think about because uh, I think I was at a workshop one time, um, probably like a storytelling for librarians or storytelling for teachers workshop. uh, And they were talking about, you know, when you do storytelling for children and especially if the story is meant to have some sort of moral, it's a good idea to ask the kids afterwards what they got from the story Mm -hmm. um because for one thing they might have totally missed the point (laughs) you know like you think you've made this really good point and they like weren't going there at all um but also maybe they uh 
got something additional from it that you hadn't expected, but is also very good. Um, and I thought, yeah, that is a great point. Um, <laughs> and so then, um, and then we have this story from my, from my real life. Um, uh, my kids were about like probably one in three years old. They were, they were little kids, uh, upstairs playing in their room and it got kind of quiet. And for people who spent time around children, you know, that that is um, suspicious. So I went upstairs to check on them and they were jumping from uh, from my daughter Virginia's bed to a pillow on the floor, over to my son Horatio's bed, to a blanket on the floor. And they were going around and around and they said, hey, the floor is lava. And I said, oh, okay, um, I see. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking like, um, on the one hand, this is really cute. And I played game like games like this. And on the other hand, I know that games like this can potentially lead to injury. And I would like to warn them about that, but I'm a storyteller. So I'm going to tell them a story and that will be better than lecturing them. So I said, Hey, come here, let me talk to you for a second. So when I was a kid, uh, my sister and I played this game, except we called it alligators. There were alligators on the floor. And uh, we were playing one time and we were going from my bed to my beanbag chair. So then we climbed up on top of the desk and then we got on the desk chair and had to get around on the back of the desk chair. And then we could lean over and get on the bed. And we were going around and around the room. And at one point we both ended up hanging on to the back of the desk chair at the same time. And that was too heavy and the chair fell over on top of us. And my hands got pinched in between the chair and the wall. And so I had this bruise and it had taken off some skin and it, it just really, really hurt. And I wanted sympathy from my parents. Um, but I also knew that they probably didn't want me playing alligators. So I went running out into the main room and my dad was right there. And I, I didn't mention how it happened, but I said, oh, my finger. And he said, I know what you were doing. It hurts, doesn't it? And then I looked at my children and I said, do you understand? And they said, yes. And then I continued, you know, I went back down the stairs and then I, I hear Virginia say to Horatio, now the floor is covered in alligators. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong lesson. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so they got the important part. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Well, I mean, I know that's got to be one of the most terrifying thing about being a parent is, you know, just the, the bodily harm part. But at the same time, you know, those everyday little, little ouchies are also how they're learning to navigate the world in so many ways. You know, it's also like really crucial because they're, they're, they're no, they're negotiating the world. They're negotiating the bodily space. You know, they're learning a lot about their bodies, but they're also like learning how to negotiate with each other. And I was just listening to something last night that was talking about how the fact that we don't let children just like play free the way that we used to is really harmful. You know, that's why we, we don't have the ability to have healthy conflict anymore. And we're just like, flip the tables and walk away because we don't, we don't know how to do that the way that we used to. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I, as someone who's read conflict diverse, I'm like, um, <laughs> how can we, how can we manage conflict? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is, it's interesting. Uh, so a common refrain in our house is participate in your own survival. Mm. Um, I do like to remind them to do that, but then there's the flip side when like you want them to take some healthy risks and, mm -hmm it's, it's hard, like trying to teach, you know, get them to learn to ride bikes. Um, yeah. or even sometimes with the, the running, like, um, Virginia's worked hard to overcome a fear of dogs when we're, cause dogs like to chase runners. 
Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) so, so she's been afraid of dogs. We've had some things where she was afraid of like running down steep hills Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she's, she's a competitive runner now in middle school, she runs cross country and track. And so, um, especially with cross country, she's had to kind of work on the hill thing. And, um, she's so much less fearful than she was, but it's hard as a parent to be like, yeah, this, this could actually hurt you. But if you don't do it like you're not you're not going to live a fulfilling life if you never do anything that that has a risk associated with it you know yeah. <laughs> wowzers okay so you know the reason why i'm having these uh online public conversations with people is because i'm doing this project i'm a little teapot um it's the reason why we have tea together cheers yeah. um and uh it's my my first big um, full length uh, story show that I've done since I started Story Muse. And uh, so the show is about my uh, journey toward uh, finding my purpose, or at least one chapter of that. Um, And I've uh, sort of like come up with these different tenets of the project are purpose, possibility, power, and passion as things that we, explore through our, our workaday lives. So I'm curious if you have, uh, thoughts, um, about what you, um, have explored through your working world. Um, and you can think about that in terms of being a librarian or a storyteller or, you know, some other like rando job that you had in your early life while you're trying to find your way toward those things. Um, if you want to tell us a quick story about the, I often ask people what's the crappiest job they ever had and what they learned from it. Um, Whatever, you know, reflection you have about uh, work and, um, and what you've learned about yourself in the process. Yeah. Okay. Um, Well, so I can say one thing about my, the first job I ever had was working at PetSmart. So I think a lot of us start in some sort of, you know, retail or food service. Yep. Um, uh, In high school, I worked on weekends and, uh, I wanted to work at PetSmart because uh, they let you bring pets in the store. And so I I knew it was a job that I could do as a high schooler, but also I thought there might be cute animals there. Yeah. Uh, my mom was really afraid I would take animals home. Mm-hmm. Um, they they had the cat rescue there over the weekend. They had cats that were up for adoption. Um, I did not ever bring an animal home. There was one time someone abandoned like a three-week-old kitten at the store, they thought the pet adoption would just take them, but they they kind of have like limits. And um, one of the other cashiers did adopt the cat. And I was like, see mom, like this, like this was the most like uh, risky moment, you know? <laughs> and somebody else took the kitten home and it was so, it had to be bottle fed and it was so tiny The this other cashier had it in their pocket um, for a couple of weeks and the managers didn't care cause it was like super cute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, they uh it was the big pet smart that's in um lawrenceville near the movie theater and they have a horse section which not all pet smarts do mm. and this was really uh like special i get a lot of the horse stuff is expensive so it was a big part of how they made money yeah at this pet smart and um so one time a pony ride company that bought a lot of their stuff from PetSmart, they came by, it was just after they had done a gig and they had the ponies and horses in trailers in the parking lot. And the manager said, go ahead and bring a couple of them inside, the customers will love it. And so they did, they had they brought in a pony and a full size horse, uh, had them walking around the store. And of course the customers did love it. They thought, oh, this is amazing. There are these anim- these like huge animals in the store, um, but, when they poop and pee in the store, who do you think cleans it up? Oh no. Not not the manager who thought it was a good idea. Right. It's like all these cashiers. Right. <laughs> and they make a much bigger mess than dogs do. <laughs> they make a huge mess. Yeah. Yeah. Like when we say clean up on aisle five, it's all <laughs> of aisle five. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So that really stood out that like. The manager is trying to like pad their reputation and think about customers uh-huh. and sales and all this stuff. And isn't this uh-huh. great? And then yeah, it's the cashiers behind the scenes who have to 
literally clean up the mess. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, like unfortunate situations have I gotten my myself into because some manager thought something was a good idea. And by manager, I mean, you know, some boss in some form or another, whether it's a, you know, restaurant manager or an executive director of a nonprofit organization. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Wow. Um, but I think as far as like being a, being a librarian and a, and a professor, um, I think that that all ties in with my love of storytelling and just stories in general. Uh-huh. And I really, I love being surrounded by stories and helping connect people with stories um, and now help, you know, helping other librarians connect their, their, their patrons with stories. Uh-huh. Um, it just feels really rewarding. I, I really believe that there is truth in every story, even if it's fiction, there's some sort of truth there that we need. Um, and that the more, the more that we can access, you know, all the stories and information out there, the more that we can connect with the truths that, that we need. Um, so it does feel like a really uh, important thing. I do feel connected to purpose. Um, sometimes when I'm answering emails, you know, or going to meetings, I don't feel that <laughs> but connected to my yeah. purpose, um, just like in any job. But I just have to remind myself, this is... <laughs> This is this is part of the meaningful work that um that that maybe at other times feels more meaningful. Yeah. Well, I hear you. It's just not your passion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not uh I, I can't say that every it, it's it's like that with any job. There's not gonna be you're not gonna be passionate about every single thing that yeah. that makes up the job. Yes. Wow. So um I also have this fun little trick where I have a dice um, booted up here. So I'm going to click start and you tell me when to stop. Stop. Tell me a story about yourself at the age of 42. 42. <laughs> um, okay. Like the Hitchhiker's Guide. <laughs> yeah. I like the Hitchhiker's Guide. Right. So that's the answer. Um so you're because you're not so I'm, yet. I'm not 42 yet. <laughs> yeah, so it's a manifesting story about the future. It's a um okay. So that's a few years, that's a few years away. Um I will be uh cl- close to getting tenure, hopefully. That will be part of my story. <laughs> nice. 42. Um uh-huh. uh hopefully doing uh doing some more storytelling I don't know what all that will look like but maybe maybe I'll find some more fringes or some other opportunities to uh do storytelling outside of the classroom um getting my kids ready to go to college which is a frightening (laughs) frightening thought given that I was (laughs) Um, like already for your friend when they were born that's really yeah. amazing to think about yes yes they're both in middle school this year but next year next year starting high school so um hmm what else? hopefully some more work around my house actually as I'm sitting here in my house thinking about oh yeah there's some stuff I'd like to do in the yard and around the house and not so much that I'd like to do but I'd like it to be done mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll appreciate it afterwards um and uh yeah I I think feeling even more connected to my community both the the community that I'm still uh you know becoming a part of in Milwaukee um having recently started at at UW Milwaukee and then um also here in in Whitewater um I'm involved in some events in the city and then also I've started hosting house concerts um, so I'm hoping that that will just, you know, continue and grow and, um, you know, we'll continue to make friends here and just feel really connected. Yeah. So speaking of work that you're, you're creating this, hopefully, you know, you'll be have gone through the cycle already by the time you're 42, but let's talk about what you're cooking up. Like what, what kind of stories are you working on right now? Let's see. I, um, I mean, I have started applying to more fringe festivals, so I've been thinking more about uh, shows 
um, like, like our plus long shows. Um, so I did, uh, the, the Elgin Fringe Festival back in September and I did an hour long show of, um, marching band stories, including playing clarinet a little bit. I had to relearn clarinet after 20 years. So that was, um, that was the whole adventure. <laughs> um, and so I may, I may take that show some other, some other places. Um, I also uh, have a, a show that I worked on previously about my time living in England um, right after my husband, John, and I got married um, that I've, I've performed that once before uh, an hour long show and I'm working on developing um, a longer show so I can really tell all the stories I want to tell, uh, but we'll also also maybe send the hour long version to some more fringe festivals. Um, and then the other show that I've like started thinking about a little bit, um, I've done, uh, so I've, I did like a, like the classic city fringe um, in Athens uh, several years ago, I told a collection of um, classical stories, uh, women from mythology. And um, I've been thinking about how to, to do a collection of, um, of my, my, my stories of heroines, um, maybe different stories, uh, but also how to even maybe string it together in a more natural way. Um, and one idea I've been playing with is um, interspersing it with some history about the Roman poet Ovid, um, who I, I owe a lot of my research to, um, and who uh, he wrote, he wrote a collection of um, uh, fictional letters called the heroides, the heroines. Um, and so in some ways he was somebody who was trying to give women voice um, even back in classical times. I don't think he could necessarily be considered a feminist or like, a, you know, <laughs> completely a hero for women, but he did start that. Um, uh, he, he was trying to give women voice. And so, um, yeah, I'm Are playing with this sure idea. He really like, was a man? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty sure. <laughs> Okay. I'm just curious because, um, you know, every once in a while there's like new things come to light about this stuff. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking about interspersing some of his story with it, with um, these heroine stories, um, maybe as a way to try to tie them, tie them together. Mm. Cool. I'm just so fascinated with your ability to create these like long form stories, because as you know, this is like what I'm trying to do right now. And um, it's, it's daunting, you know, especially when your you know, main stock and trade as mine has been, is like showing up at these, you know, one-off events where you throw your name in the hat and you only get five minutes. It's like, it's like the difference between trying to run five minutes and trying to run for an hour. You know? <laughs> So uh, I'm curious if you, um, like, what are your, your um, questions or observations about this teapot project? Like, I'm wondering, like, since we've, you know, had a few times of like touching in about it, like, what are you seeing as it's moving along? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the angle of the, um, the crappy jobs. I like, I think that's very, I think that's very relatable. I think that everyone has worked at least one job that was that was really crappy <laughs> um and then uh I know you've talked about previously that it's sort of like around the the turn of the millennium um and just like connections between that time and our our current time because there's like the technology has changed a lot but there are some other um some other things that maybe haven't <laughs> haven't changed that much um especially around work and people's satisfaction with work yeah 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 it's interesting that some of those echoes between that time and now oh you know I was going to tell you about the the horses um one time so I've done all of this like house sitting and animal sitting and you know like taking care of of things for people over the years and I got into this situation when I was in my early 20s during that period of time where um, this man that I worked with, uh, had horses and was going out of town and asked me if I would horse sit for him. And I had zero experience with horses, zero. I mean, I had, you know, I'd taken care of some cats and dogs 
And that was it. Um, and so he'd had me over to this, um, you know, barn up on a hill in Southwest Virginia, which was about 45 minutes away from where I lived. And I wasn't even sure if they were paying me or not. You know, this was, you know, this guy that I had worked with for a couple of months for the, in this temp situation that I was in. And um, he walked me through one time, you know, how, how to like feed these, these animals. And uh, then they left for the weekend. And he did say like, you have to be forceful with horses. Like you have to be like the alpha. Um, well, I, I got up there. I think I, I, I had to go like once in the morning and once in the evening on a Saturday and a Sunday. And it wasn't until this this incident happened on a Sunday morning where the horses backed me into the corner where I had the mm. feed bucket in my hand and like just refused to stop eating it, which was a big problem because horses are only supposed to eat the amount that they're supposed to eat. And if they eat more, then it can make them sick. And when I tried to like smack their fannies, which is what you're supposed to do to like show your dominance and like make them move. <laughs> one of them kicked me, Ooh. like kicked at me. It like, it didn't actually kick me, but it kind of like kicked the bucket and like the, it kind of knocked into my ribs. And then I got really scared because here I was in this like barn up in a field. And this was before the days of ubiquitous cell phones. Like if it had like broken a rib or something, like I would have been up there for a day before anybody found me, you know, um, fortunately, you know, I was uninjured, but, um, and I, I got out of there and I, I basically just like left the feed bucket and, and got out of there. Cause I was kind of scared and didn't know what else to do. Well, when they, they came home, the horses were kind of sick cause they'd eaten too much food. And then they were really pissed at me. Well, what, what, you know, I didn't know what else to do except for like, get out of there. You know? And apparently they'd had to stay up all night long, just like walking the horses. Cause basically what they end up doing is they constipate themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to like walk them and walk them and walk them until they poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, horses, they, they do make a mess. They are, they are a big deal. So I'm, I'm having lots of uh, empathy with your, your, having them like make a mess in the middle of a building that's not supposed to be handling horse crap <laughs> yeah yeah and they're big I mean like I know people keep keep them like they're domestic but they're big yeah if they don't if they don't like what you're doing I mean they, they yeah. can do a lot of damage <laughs> oh lordy yeah talk about crappy jobs <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I know my mom had mixed feelings about me having a job in high school, but I think part of her hope was that uh, I learned I didn't like that and that I definitely needed to go to college, um, yeah. which I, I wasn't I wasn't up in the air about college. I was going to go to college. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't great. Um but I, you know, I think this is, and this is one of the, the kind of uh, like job issues we continue to have is like, you can't really make enough money to support yourself mm -hmm. doing that. So I don't know. I mean, like maybe, maybe if I could afford an okay place to live and just be a cashier all day, maybe I would do that, you know? <laughs> well, I think it kind of relates back to what we were talking about your kids playing. Like, I think there, it is a rite of passage to have those kinds of like unempowering jobs where you have to work with the public and you learn uh tenacity you learn um all kinds of things in having to have those jobs um and it does you know encourage you to to want something better and different for yourself to you know um and i remember um one of those like guru type people like I don't know, Oliver Berkman or something. I, that's not who it was, but one of those type people t was on a podcast or something and talked about how when he had one of those jobs, when he was a young person, um, he was, was struggling, but he still, um, 
you know, he did his best and he, he showed up every day and his boss reflected to him that that was a skill that was going to serve him well. You know, yeah. the fact that he still brought his A game every day to a job that he was clearly not meant for for the rest of his life was something that, you know, was going to pay off over time. And I, I've always thought about that little anecdote as something that I feel like was kind of true for me. I've, I've almost never had a job where I just phoned it in, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it felt like that's what I was doing. Then I knew it was time for me to move on. Yeah. Cause I'm not really capable of phoning it. in. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and there are good, useful skills that you learn, like, um, in, in librarianship, especially public libraries, you work with the public. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I know I've had students who, who think, oh, I have so little, you know, so little life experience, so little job experience. And it's like, did you work retail? Then you'll be fine in a public library. <laughs> like learn some things about libraries, but also there, there are some similarities. <laughs> yeah. Oh my word. I mean, we could talk for the next hour about libraries being the front lines of, uh, all the things right now, I feel like they're just not being recognized as um, the intersection for people that they are today. And, uh, you know, social work, you know, a a lot of libraries are having to actually literally hire social workers now because they're, they're where so many people are going for very substantial human needs. Um, Maybe not so yeah. much in university settings, but definitely our public libraries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The library is, um, y'all be kind to your librarians. So <laughs> like a lot of professions, uh, li- libraries had a hard time during COVID. Like they did a lot to try t- to be creative, to meet needs. Um, there were school librarians uh, in lots of places that started driving books around and dr- dropping books off with students. So they still had books to read. Um, school and public libraries were helping people um, connect to Wi-Fi in one way or another, like checking yeah. out hotspots or putting up these Wi-Fi benches or boosting the Wi-Fi into their parking lots. Um, they did so many things to keep people connected. They were some of the first places to open back up um, because people needed them. And, you know, as we've seen with some other places where we've had essential workers, they um, there wasn't necessarily a lot of like like respect or appreciation for the risk or for the extra effort. Um, and so I feel like that's an area where, um, you know, people are getting burned out. Yeah. And so we need some, we need some love and we need people to keep training to be librarians. Yeah. <laughs> we can help you out know, the people who are burned out. Right. Our buddy, uh, David, he, uh, created, um, the library because the library yeah. was right next to the court and so many people were showing up and needing to have a tie when they were appearing in court. So he created a checkout system where people could come and get a tie before they appeared for their court. That's just, librarians are the best. They really yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love, I love meeting other librarians and visiting libraries and just seeing all the amazing stuff. Uh, people come up with all kinds of things. I would never, I would never yeah. think of. Yeah. Well, in our closing minutes, um, I'm wondering, like, what's a, what's a thing that you always wish, like, if you had a microphone like this, that you wanted to be able to tell people? I'm just curious if you have, like, a story you want to share or a song you want to sing, a challenge you want to throw down for the new year, anything at all. Wow. Um, Um, Make sure people read. Oh, wow. Uh, I think just, um, just be, be kind to each other. Um, you know, in some of my reading about the hero's journey, um, Joseph Campbell, like he wasn't just observing, like writing about an outline that he saw in folk tales. Like he really believed that there was a deeper meaning, like this truth that is coming out in the stories that we tell. And he really thought that deeper meaning was that we are actually all connected and, and therefore like we should be kind to each other (laughs) and should act like we're all connected. Um, And, and I see that more and more in, in 
stories um, and just think it's a beautiful way to try to live, a difficult way to try to mm -hmm. live, um, but <laughs> beautiful and something worth as aspiring towards. That's fantastic. Well, folks, you can follow Sarah Beth Nelson on all kinds of platforms, including her website, Vox Fabularum, which is uh, uh, Latin for, I think, voice, a uh, fabulous voice. What, what is, tell us what Vox, oh, voice, -O -S. voice of, voice of the stories. Voice of the stories. Of course. Yeah. I love it. V-O-X-F-A-B-U-L-U-R-U-N.com. Correct? <laughs> B O X F A B U L A R U M. Fabulous. Um, and we'll post that as we do our follow ups as well. And um, I just think you're fantastic and I'm so glad to know you. And um, if anybody's listening to this and uh, loves to talk about storytelling or has an idea that they want to, um, talk about um, what we learn about ourselves from work uh, or the teapot project, hit me up and you can be one of our next tea with jam uh, participants and y'all have a great start to your new year. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.